Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You know, when I'm in this room, I usually invite all my students to come to the front. I usually insist, but I'm not going to do that this afternoon. So I'm Marcia Roy, and I'm going to be the chair for this session. We're going to be talking about climate change. And I was thinking that 30 years ago, you know, one of the important research topics would be biotechnology, and maybe 15, 20 years ago, their development in forensic science and genomics, but today, the it thing to do is climate studies, because it's so important, it's so cross-cutting, it affects all of us. And I'm very proud to say that at Mona, we have some of the best experts in the region with the Climate Studies Research Group. They collaborate with geography and geology, with life sciences, and everybody knows that the head of that group is um, Professor Michael Taylor. You know, I like to call him the billion dollar man, okay? <laughs> and behind every good man, you know, there's a better woman. And so we also have Dr. Tanisha Stevenson. But re what's really important is both Michael and Tanisha, they have a wonderful group of young scientists that they're training, so we're in good hands for the future when it comes to climate change. So we are going to hear from Carl Frederick Sloschner, and Carl was telling me that he's from Germany, and everybody knows that I'm from St. Elizabeth, okay? And the brown eyes and the brown hair, history tells us that there was a German ship that crashed in St. Elizabeth, and so we have German in our blood. So Carl, welcome to Jamaica. So Michael is going to introduce our speaker, and then he's going to talk to us about climate science impact and climate analysis. So Professor Taylor, billion dollar man. Okay, I'm supposed to launch a presentation at this point, and I, I don't know how to do this, but all right. So, if you look in your program, what I've been asked to do is to do two things. I'm supposed to set a context, and then I'm supposed to introduce our guest speaker. Clearly, the, the, the introduction of the guest speaker is the one that I'm happiest doing. <laughs> you know, that's a, a great task because we have a great person. Uh, setting the context, I think there are so many other more capable and competent people in the room who could do it. But anyway, since I have been asked, let me quickly set a context. Why are we here? Why are we talking about climate? Why do we have an afternoon devoted to climate? Why is climate ha taking up a little bit of the conversation space now? in our region and in our, our nation. Why this emphasis on climate? That's the context that I'm going to try to set. I'm going to try to do it in five slides, which is a very difficult task when you think about, <laughs> about climate. We're here, and the context I want to set, really, I think, I want to set using 2017. So why climate? 2017 is your answer. Let me explain what I mean. So 2017 was a very memorable year in terms of many things for the Caribbean and certainly for, uh, for, the Jamaican, for Jamaica as well. So both for the Caribbean region and for Jamaica. Memorable for many reasons, and we could go into a lot of the reasons, and I don't know what first pops to your mind when you think of 2017, but among the reasons it was memorable was for weather and for climate. If we think about the region, it was memorable First of all, because of, all right, if I can get this to move, no, all right. If we think about the region, it was memorable because of a picture that looks like this. In 2017, across the region, we had three category five hurricanes that passed over the Eastern Caribbean islands within two weeks of each other, Irma, Jose Marie, Maria. So, 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 so we know this, and, and it became particularly memorable in the Caribbean region, and will probably stay, stand out in our memory for quite a while to come, unless this year, of course, eclipses it. It left quite a bit of damage across the region 
Dominica, Puerto Rico, Barbuda, Turks and Caicos, and you can go up the island chain. 2017 was memorable in the Caribbean because of this. In Jamaica, we never quite faced the same hurricanes. We never got either Irma, Maria, Jose, none of them. However, 2017 was still a memorable year for us in terms of climate, particularly, and all of, the, of us from Jamaica would say, because of the amount of rain we got. Now, the rain didn't all fall in, in nice, steady sheets of rain that didn't, but rather, we had a year full of rain and particularly lots of flooding events, both on the western side, the eastern side. In fact, lots of flooding events, different times of the year throughout the country. So 2017 was memorable for Jamaica and is easily captured by the headlines in our newspapers. So this is 2017 in climate for Jamaica. Jamaica's growth streak ends as rain and beat army worm take toll. 2017 stopped our growth streak. Flood drowns coffee. Recent rain dampens sugar production. Costly waste, heavy rains leave roads in a deplorable state. At least we have an excuse. Sorry. And then several Napen communities flooded on, on the rain. And then, of course, the famous picture, hand carts, rescue cruise ships, a new form of tourism. 2017 was memorable in Jamaica for its climate. This then is our context that I'm arguing for why we are spending some time looking on climate. Because 2017 reinforced that we are extremely climate sensitive, both as a country and as a region. There are lots of reasons for this sensitivity, clearly. I mean, we're sensitive because we pattern our life about our own climate. We're sensitive because we have limited space to live. We are small islands. We are impacted by climate. We're sensitive because of the things that we make our, our livelihoods out of. Our context is 2017 because we are extremely sensitive to climate. Where am I going with this? Because we're extremely sensitive to climate, then climate demands our attention. And this is why we are here. We are here because of this sensitivity which makes climate demand our attention. Why does it demand our attention? Well, look on the headlines. It demands our attention because the first thing climate is doing is just rendering our development pillars unreliable. The things we'd want to rely on for climate, uh, for, for development, agriculture, sugar, coffee, in their present form are so extremely sensitive to climate, climate is simply rendering the development pillars on which we are depending unreliable. Well, it's not only that it's rendering our development pillars unreliable, climate is making our development goals unattainable. We have set 2030 as our development goal standard. And all of us know Vision 2030 to make Jamaica the place to live, work, <laughs> raise families, and, and do business. That is our goal. That goal is suggesting that we will have a standard of life and a quality of life that will be of, of the developed nature. What is climate doing in its present state? And what is the projected climate doing? It's pushing that goal a little further away by the state of the roads it's leaving us in, by the erratic water supply, by the health system, etc. We Climate demands our attention because it's making our development goals simply unattainable. And if it does that to our development pillars and it does that to our development goals, then climate demands our goal, our attention, because it's requiring action to make our development agenda untouchable. Climate demands our attention simply because if we really want to reach those development goals and they must be untouchable, we must pay attention to climate. That is the context. So let me use that to segue into my introduction. <laughs> if it demands action, what kind of action and by whom? It clearly demands action by us as a nation and us as a region. And you know the kinds of action it requires. Mitigation, reducing the amount of greenhouse gases that cause a problem. Adaptation, learning to live with the problem of climate because there's just a certain amount of climate change we have, as our world, have committed to. And clearly education, which is what this forum represents. But it also requires global action. And that is my segue. <laughs> 
in, into my introduction. The Caribbean region has called for this global action, and it has called for it on a very catchy phrase that a lot of us know and we can repeat easily, 1.5 to stay alive. And, and simply put, it's saying we must limit temperature increase by the end of the century to 1.5 degrees as a world if the Caribbean and small island states are to become viable. This is the context for why we are here today. I used 2017, but I could have used several other years, and I could use several years in the future. We are here because of that sensitivity. That sensitivity means that climate demands our attention. And if it demands our attention, it demands action, including global action, embodied in that phrase, 1.5 to stay alive. Ah, that then is why we have our speaker, Dr. Carl Frederick Schleusner. <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> so you may say, well, I'm not so clear. What is the link? Well, allow me to introduce you to him. And let me introduce you to him in this way. When we've thought about who would be the ideal speaker for this climate session, this session at the Faculty of Science and Technology 11th conference, this conference that brings together young people, especially our graduate students, and, and certainly young academics, but everybody, we decided that there were three characteristics we wanted in our guest speaker. The first characteristic, we wanted somebody who was a young achiever who inspires. Does Dr. Carl Friedrich Schleusner meet that criteria? Yes. Well, he certainly is young. <laughs> you know, and nowadays I'm very much cognizant of, of young people. <laughs> he certainly is young, you know, and I know he doesn't mind me telling you that he's in his early 30s, very, very early 30s. In, in the academic world, that's young. <laughs> is, he, is he an achiever? Absolutely. By the time Carl was in his early 20s, he had acquired a, a first-class BSc of Honours in Applied Physics from Cork, Ireland, an MSc of Honours in Physics, and you know, we, we, we like the physics part, <laughs> from University of, and I, oh, I'm struggling with this, Würzburg, kind of there, <laughs> in Germany. And he had gotten his PhD from the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact and Research, also in Germany. All of these he achieved with high honours. By any measure, he is an achiever, um, and a young achiever who certainly can inspire. All of this he did with high honors by the time he was in his early 20s. So we said, yes, Carl fits that bill. But we weren't just looking for a young achiever who inspires. We were looking for somebody who embodies excellence that could be emulated. Does Carl fit that bill? Yes, absolutely. There are many standards which we could use to judge excellence. In the academic world, one of them we use is publications. Over the last two years, Carl, I counted them, Carl has 16 publications. We heard about the averages, <laughs> averages this morning. 16 publications in some of the best journals. Two of them in Nature Climate Change, and, two of them in, and, and at least one in Nature Communications, and several other high-impact journals. Is he committed to excellence? Absolutely, yes. Excellence has many measures, and I would, if I can, I know he'll forgive me for stepping into his private life. He's not just an excellent academic, he's an excellent classical singer, but today he will not give you any of that excellence. <laughs> but we were looking for somebody who embodies excellence that could be emulated, that's Carl. And then the last thing we said we wanted, a young achiever who inspires, that's Carl. Somebody who embodies excellence that can be emulated, that's certainly Carl. And thirdly, we wanted somebody who is doing science for society, and I've added this little part that goes even beyond his personal sphere. That's the link to 1.5. Carl is a European scientist. <laughs> And he could have spent his time studying the North Atlantic circulation or the polar vortex or a jet or something like that. But if you look at his, his CV, a lot of his time and his career has been devoted to the 1.5 problem. 
a lot of his time has been devoted to the same problem that the Caribbean has put forward. He has become noted for his work on the 1.5. He's very well known for that. He has done quality research that steps outside what you would naturally think that he would do. It's important that this 1.5 science is done. It is the basis on which our Caribbean um, premise our survival. And, and just to cap it off, he is, of course, a researcher at the University of Humboldt, but he's also a part of the head of science for, um, at Science and Impacts at the Climate Analytics, which is an institute in Germany that is running a very important project that advises Caribbean governments right now on the 1.5 to stay alive. Any of these individually would have made him a great choice. Put it together, was Dr. Carl Friedrich Schleusner the right person? I think you would agree with me. Yes, he was. Ladies and gentlemen, to speak to us about 1.5, a global perspective, Dr. Carl Friedrich Schleusner. Well, thank you, Michael, and I'm, I, I have to admit I'm a bit humbled now, and I, uh, and I hope I can uh, live up to the expectations that have been raised. Uh, I can only say I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I'm, 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 you know, when I got this invitation uh, by Tinesha and Michael, I, was, I felt very humbled that, that our collaboration and the work that we do is seen so relevant uh, to join you here at this, this event of your faculty, and I have to say, uh, we're now basically in the second session of the second day. I, I'm very impressed by the work that's being done here, by the quality of the presentation, by the quality of the interdisciplinary exchange that you also have between the faculties. And I really very much enjoyed being here. Um, so what I will want to talk about is 1.5 degrees, a global perspective. Why a global perspective? Because uh, for the regional perspective, you have the champions of this in your faculty. Uh, you will today, later today, there will be 1.5 Caribbean climate project being launched and you'll learn a lot about impacts of 1.5 degrees in the Caribbean uh, and how it differs from other global warming targets. And this has been outstanding work that has been done largely also here uh, at the climate group in, uh, at UB Mona. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, refrain from stepping at Etzeran. I would uh, never ever be competitive. So I'll stay at a global level and I'll talk to you a little bit about what one, where 1.5 degree came from, what it means, and also about a little bit of the political context and the processes that are on the way. Um, so this is a bit of my outline that I'll talk you through. There will be a lot of interdisciplinary elements to this. So I'll also talk a little bit about, let's say, the climate mitigation aspect of that goal and the requirements of that. Um, but I'll, I'll hope you, you, you'll be able to follow. If you don't, um, yeah, or if I speak not loud enough, thank you, then just give me a sign. <laughs> All right, let's, let's jump right in and introduce the long-term temperature goal. Uh, as I've just seen, you're all quite familiar with, this w with the one and a half degrees globally, but uh, let's see where this comes from and why it has been established in the first place. Um, to start with, warming targets expressed as global mean temperature is nothing that we can ever feel, right? We feel regional climate. Most of us just feel weather. Weather just basically changes stochastically. We, we may even see a long-term trend, but it always will be regional. None of us can experience something abstract like a global mean temperature. But why has it been then chosen as a focal point of the debate? The reason is it brings several characteristics with it that allow us to connect climate action and climate impacts and therefore uh, basically a comprehensive picture of the assessments that we First and foremost, a lot of impacts like regional temperatures, changes in some dynamical features and so on, sea surface temperatures scale with global mean temperatures. So it's a good proxy to say all of the globe how changes will look like. Second of all, and I'll show that to you in a minute, it can guide our efforts to mitigate climate change. So once we have a temperature goal, we know by how much we need to reduce our emissions to get that. Um, but it is important to bear in mind that it's not a scientific goal. There is no scientist stepped up and said, this is what, you know, where we need to go. It is eventually the result of risk assessment. It's to think about it as a speed limit. It's a focal point of debate. We all know if you go with 70 miles per hour through a village, that's too fast. That's simply too risky. You don't do that. Uh, therefore, you need to come up with a speed limit 
uh, that tells you how fast you're allowed to go. And similarly, uh, what we want to do in, with climate protection is we want to protect and avoid dangerous climate change. Right? We don't want to get too much climate change. We want to limit it to a certain amount. And then we were looking for a focal point like a speed limit, and this is where the uh, global mean temperature goal uh, came in. So um, now I pressed the wrong button. There we go. Um, but it's a political defined target. So different political groups may come to different resolutions as different people may have different views about how fast you should go in a municipality. Um, this is one of the famous graphs of the IPCC uh, last assessment that I'll, I, I put this up because it shows you and, and, and emphasizes the point I've just been making about how global uh, climate risks are scaling with mean temperature. So you see two thermometers here left and right and then a range of rather abstract formulated risks, unique in certain systems. Okay, what, what can this be? Well, it's coral reefs and indigenous peoples, livelihoods and uh, things like that. Extreme weather, okay, we know what extreme weather is and you in the Caribbean in particular. Uh, distribution of impacts, which is a range of impacts on different sectors globally and some other elements as well. And you see basically it goes from a, a light yellowish color down to a purple color and yellowish means it's a moderate risk and the more it gets purple, the uh, worse the risk gets. So we see, okay, it scales reasonably well with global mean temperature, so maybe it's a good indicator to guide us where we want to go. Now comes the second property of the global mean temperature goal. And this is far from trivial um, that it is actually such a clear relationship, but it's one of the well, most well-established ones in climate science. That global mean temperature is scaling with the cumulative emissions of CO2 over time. CO2 stays in the atmosphere for uh, centuries to millennia. And this is part of the problem. So all, every ton of CO2 we emit contributes to climate change. Um, and global mean temperature increases reasonably linear with the cumulative anthropogenic CO2 emissions, so with our emissions over time. Um, and therefore, we can construct a carbon, a thing called a carbon budget. We can say, if you want to reach a certain goal, how much CO2 can we emit? There is some uncertainty here, so this colored range indicates the uncertainty around that response of the climate system. I'll come back to that later. But by and large, there's a linear relationship here. And there's another important message here uh, that tells us that every, ton of that every ton of CO2 contributes to climate change. If we want to stop climate change, we need to cease all emissions. That's the other side to it. As long as we keep emitting, uh, we will, climate change will continue and global mean temperatures will continue to rise. That's the other important message there. And since we know the budget and we know what we have emitted so far, and not so much uh, the Caribbean though, but many other parts of the world, we do know where we need to go. So these are uh, emission reduction targets in 2050 relative to 2010. Um, it's probably a bit far, uh, difficult to read from the back, but um, I, I, you know, I guess you get the general sense of it. So if it's, if it's below that line, you need to have quite drastic reductions. And let's say we want to limit warming to one and a half degrees. We know we have such a budget somewhere around here. And then we can directly deduce, okay, in 2050, we need to reduce uh, annual CO2 emissions by more than 50% uh, from 2010. Uh, and this is basically, in a nutshell, the results of the last IPCC report. It's one of the key figures that they brought up in their summary for policymakers. This is, if, you, if there's anything you want to know about climate change, this is it. Um, and global mean temperatures are at the very heart of it. And this is why there is such an important tool for climate action. Um, so now jump a little bit into the history, but they haven't always been there. Initially, uh, it was, the goal was climate protection, but then there was the question, okay, yeah, climate protection, how do we instrumentalize it? Uh, how do we go about it? And then global mean temperatures came in, and there was the European Union in 1996 that first uh, came up with a, the two degree limit, which is uh, a, a higher limit above the one and a half degree limit that is also still in the Paris Agreement. And most of you may be very familiar with it. Um, by 2009, this was taken up by, uh, by the G8 uh, as the limit for climate protection. And um, already at the same time, uh, about 100 vulnerable countries, uh, including first and foremost also CARICOM countries, were calling for one and a half degrees. I said on the very basis that everything that uh, Prof. Taylor has shown you about 2017 is the impact of a warming of one degree. Yeah. So even going to one and a half, that's where we are now. Even going to one and a half degree will only amplify the threat by climate change that it's already experienced. And this was clear already back then that the threat of climate change that's already there, twice as much, more than twice as much as it was in 2009, 
uh, is not is unbearable. It's not safe. It was clear just by extrapolation that uh, I, um, that this is no there's no couldn't be an agreement of the most vulnerable to a two degree goal as a safe target, and they would be fine with climate change because the impacts of climate change were already at their doorstep. Um, then in 2010. Uh, this goal was enshrined in the climate negotiation process called the UNFCCC, the Uni uh, United Nations Framework uh, uh, Convention on Climate Change, which is, if, any, uh, if there's a, a climate conference, if you hear it in the news in the media, that's the body that does that. Uh, and it was only done, and uh, Caribbean countries would only agree to that under the condition that the adequacy of this goal would be reviewed, so that, that we bring science into the political process, and this is why I brought it in. Yes, I think it's a nice lesson to le be learned here about the power of science and good quality science uh, for political processes uh, if this uh, goal is to be reviewed. And this has happened uh, between 2013 and 2015 on a thing called structured expert dialogue. Bear with me, it will be soon be over. It's, I, I go through some technical terms here, but I think there is a message. I hope there's a message for you as well and for, uh, for how to inform uh, science political interfaces. And um, so it was seven, more than 70 experts, including a lot of IPCC, um, which is the um, scientific uh, body that um, advises UNFCCC and writes um, major reports, one of which Michael Taylor very prominently cha champions the impact chapter. Um, <coughs> this body uh, was brought in many other experts from the World Bank, from U other UN bodies and so on, and they uh, gave testimonies about climate impacts, future climate assessments, and so on. Uh, one of them was also Dr. Leonard Nurse from UV uh, Barbados, who also was part of this process and contributed to this, to this uh, um, assessment. And what they found uh, is, first and foremost, what I just explained to you, that a long-term temperature goal is a good thing. It works. We can use it as a science policy tool. It works as a focal point for our climate action. But then they also found that two degrees it cannot be considered safe. It's an ined inadequate goal when it's about uh, climate protection. Um, they found that one and a half would come with several advantages, and then they also found that there's much less science on the one and a half degree goal, which is why uh, uh, Prof. Prof Taylor is now uh, in the special report of this IPCC on one and a half degrees, because basically this was the kick, this kick started the process that started the special report where we are now. And these were very important findings because they were all before the Paris Agreement. And many of you may have heard about the Paris Agreement as a major breakthrough in the national uh, diplomacy when it comes to climate change and climate protection. And one of the major elements of this Paris Agreement is that in its purpose article, so what this agreement is set to do, and this is when it was just agreed, it's, it's a little more than two years ago, it feels like a lifetime given the changes in the political landscape globally, but um, it says that the the goal of all this is to holding the increase in global average temperature to well below two degrees and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to one and a half above pre-industrial levels. So this is where the one and a half degree goal eventually comes in. Um, and all of this was achieved uh, because of this science process and the, and the ability of bringing science into this. And now, basically, over the coming years, this will only repeat. We will have, under the Paris Agreement, more and more such reviews, such stock takes, things like that, that will be informed by science and need to be informed by science and need to be informed also by regional science. And this is why the work uh, you are doing here is also so important and can even, well, quickly, so to say, make its way up to very international levels, which is, I think, also a very encouraging uh, thing to know. Um, so yeah, so we know that uh, it is basically a risk assessment. It has a very strong political component to it. Um, but what is it exactly? How can we, you know, how can we understand it? We, we, we all ag agreed it's a bit of an abstract thing, but how it is, is it defined? You know, what, what are the nuts and bolts of it? So it is really an anthropogenic component, so it needs to be a global average of 20 years or more in order to average out natural variability that we have in the climate system, which is very profound. Those of you working in climate science know this very well. Uh, and it's also not relating to regional warming, so it's not the warming in the Caribbean, it's not the warming in the Arctic. It's not the warming over the US. It is really a global average. Uh, and it can easily mean that warming in the Arctic can be way, way higher than one and a half degrees above uh, uh, pre-industrial levels. Uh, it, is, it is important to, be, uh, to bear in mind because 
you'll, you'll come across newspaper articles, people will report about climate change in the Caribbean and so on and give you a number, but this is not relating to the global temperature goal and can be confusing at times, so which, which is why uh, I, was, I, I, uh, I wanted to clarify that. Um, and it means, and that's another important thing, it's a mean goal and there's natural variability still around. If the mean is one and a half degrees, that means every other year is warmer than one and a half degrees. That means you will have annual mean temperatures that exceed one and a half degrees and can be quite a considerable margin. Uh, and uh, so this, is, this would be a distribution of global mean temperature on the annual basis uh, relative to the, to the long-term mean. And how this could look like, this is just a stylized global mean temperature trajectory. This is the uh, 20 year average and this is, these are the annual temperatures. And you can see you can easily have like four or five years above it. If you have a strong El Nino year, this will, you know, you have a spike in global mean temperatures and so on. And we need to be mindful of that because you'll get a lot of messages and you'll be bombarded with, yeah, this year has been the warmest on record and it's so close to one and a half or whatsoever, but it's not what the global mean temperature goal is about. It's a long-term goal that's linked to anthropogenic warming. Uh, and if we were to change that, this obviously would mean that we would need to uh, ever lower um, mean temperature goals. So if we say we don't want to have it exceeded every second year, but just one in 10 years or one in 20 years, that would mean that our uh, one in 20 years would, would mean that our long-term warm equivalent would be 1.3 degrees. So it would actually go down by quite a margin. And if we wanted to say we want to exclude that one and a half degrees is ever exceeded in any single year, what we know about the range of climate variability, we know that we are already there. We can, e we can have, in the very extreme cases, from our uh, climate models that we have looked at, we can have years that are more up to a half a degree warmer than the long-term annual mean. So yes, um, it is important, I hope I, I was able to convince you, it's important to know exactly what 1.5 refers to, because if you get it slightly wrong, you get slightly different numbers, but these slightly different numbers have quite big implications. Because as we, as we have learned before, the global mean temperature number is directly linked to the carbon budget. So if you aim for something different, you, it means that your carbon budget, so the amount of emissions you still have left, changes by quite a bit. So we, we have these numbers here. So for example, one in 20 years would be a reduction in carbon budget by 420 ton, two gigaton CO2. This doesn't mean anything to you, but if I say it's 12 years of present day CO2 emissions, you, can, you see that it's quite a, a sizable amount. So if, if we get it wrong, we aim for something uh, that we, that we don't, didn't want to achieve in the first place, and our uh, budget, so the amount of emissions and the amount of climate protection that we can achieve will differ. Okay, uh, so that's just a very general idea of the global mean temperature goal. Where did it come from? It might not be perfectly clear by now. Uh, if there's still questions open at the end of the talk, please you know, just shoot at me, let me, let me know, and I think we can, we can clarify, I hope I can, we can clarify a lot of them. But I now want to go into the question, does half a degree make a difference? So you have seen this two degree goal, you have seen the one and a half degree goal, what, what, you know, what is this all about? What can we say about a, a seemingly small difference? It's not so seemingly small as I've told you because all the impacts that, that, that we've seen are happening at one degree, but still it, you know, it doesn't feel like much. Um, and there's a, a second question that we need to ask us uh, as scientists right away is, um, do we have reason to believe that it makes a difference? Do we have um, you know, a good understanding of the system? What can we say about it? And what kind of tools do we have to detect the difference? And in terms of future climate change for climate uh, scientists like us, this will always be models. Uh, if you want to detect the future difference between 1.5 and 2, you have to rely on the climate model. Um, we may have decent climate models. They have some uncertainties, but they are good. But for example, if you want to investigate future impacts in some agriculture sectors, or the water sector, or on disease spreading and so on, we may quickly reach the limits on the quality of the models that we have uh, in order to make good statements about these differences. So uh, what, we've, what we've done to just get an idea whether or not we need to expect a difference between one and two, we looked at the past. Because as it happens, if we have one degree of warming, well, we have half a degree of warming as well. So we can look back in, in history, and uh, as it happens, just the last 50 years or so over the second half of the 20th century, that's around about half a degree of warming. As you've seen here, so that we, we took the uh, well, 1991 to 2010 period and then just subtracted half a degree, and we end there 1960s, 1979. And this is just a period where we actually have sufficient data records for a lot of impacts. We don't really have 
timelines and data for many climate but also sectoral impacts of climate change that date back further than the 1950s because, well, before Second World War, they, they are scattered and just very few. Um, so we can look at those. Um, and we did that for a range of extreme event indicators, so extreme hot days, extreme hot nights, or extreme cold nights, which is the second one, uh, lengths of warm spell durations, which is an indicator for heat waves, uh, also and also extreme precipitation. And basically, the shaded area is what you would expect stochastically um, out of natural variability, basically. And the, these curves are different observational records, and you see they all differ very considerably. So yes, for a wide range of extreme indicators, including extreme precipitation and the floods we've just seen, including uh, extreme temperatures, it makes a difference. We know that. And then we can again go back to what we, you know, to a broader body of knowledge that we have, which again is this IPCC report I was referring to earlier. And we can see what they have found in terms of impacts of climate change already occurring. And this is a very cluttered figure, and lots of the IPCC figures are a bit cluttered. But just you know, to give you an impression, it basically blue is physical systems, glaciers, rivers, lakes, coastal erosion. Green is biological systems, terrestrial as well as marine ecosystems. And red are human-managed systems like food production, livelihood, health, and economics. And, if, and this is the scale. So the, the bars here indicate the strength of the impact. And if it's colored, there's a clear link to climate change being established in the scientific literature. And you see there are lots of evidence. There's lots of evidence for climate change of just about half a degree warming, or in many cases even less, making a difference on the ground. These numbers that you can see here give numbers of papers that are included in these assessments. And for example, for Europe, it's uh, more than 10,000 publications. So it's a very robust basis for saying, yes, half a degree makes a difference. Um, what you can also see is that for small islands, although the impacts are felt very much, uh, there is not so much robust evidence. There is some evidence for marine systems, but for human systems in particular, but also from changes in the climate system, there is not so much there. And it's not because the change is not happening, it's just because the databases and the amount of scientific publications was not yet there. And um, therefore, I, I think it's really great to see that this is now really changing and, and, and uh, UV Mona being you know, one of the driving forces changing exactly that because this gap needs to be filled when you compare it with the other regions. Okay, so we know that half a degree makes a difference in the past. Uh, so now what about the future? We are a bit more confident that maybe we can also look into our models and we've done quite some analysis of this and I just go through you know, some of these impacts. I'm not going to talk you through all of them in really great detail, but just some spotlights here and there. So one is extreme temperatures. We have seen already extreme temperatures are going up. Um, and this is just a curve for one in thousand day temperature extremes. And they will increase very profoundly by more than 15 times compared to pre-industrial levels under one and a half degree warming. And they will almost double under two. Why will they almost double? Because, well, it's an it's extreme event distribution and you're shifting the mean. And the more you shift the mean, you basically the extremes go up in a non-linear fashion. And this is, this is the real risk of extreme events, that they are increasing much faster than the mean. So half a degree in um, global mean temperature can easily mean six or eight degrees up in night extreme uh, low nighttime temperatures in Arctic regions, for example. So there is uh, a strong nonlinear relationship at times when it comes to these indicators, and that's important to bear in mind. It also means that heat waves become much more frequent. Already under one and a half degrees, what would have been the heat wave in the just recent past would occur around two months a year uh, in, 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 in constant like um, duration. And this would increase by another 50% under two. Um, so, and this is a little bit, you know, it's a heat wave out of a climate of a low natural variability, but it still is quite detrimental because human systems as well as ecosystems are not used to this extreme heat. If you look at European climate, you have a lot of natural variability in the system. So you have hot summers, not so hot summers, and so on. In tropics, it's much more stable. And basically, moving out of this much more stable climate is a risk for a lot of ecosystems that are not at all used to any of these climatical changes. And also, for us, it is really, it is really an, uh, a, a risk. This is, these are curves uh, for outside labor productivity. And this is from a medical journal. That's not even a climate journal. That's the Lancet, which is uh, the leading journal in medicine. And, um, and this is heat wave length they've, they've investigated. And this is outside labor productivity since the 2000s, over the last 18 years. And you see that outside labor productivity, first and foremost in tropical countries, is already going down 
because of extreme temperatures. Well, we all know this, right? We cannot work in the extreme heat. You know, we cannot be exposed to temperatures of 30, 40 degrees and do you know, efficient outside labor. Um, but it, it, this is already measurable, and this is an effect detrimental to economic development and, yeah, to precisely this sustainable development that uh, um, Prof. Taylor was referring to before. Um, so extreme heat methods. Um, I hope you agree with me there. Uh, another thing, and we've learned a lot yesterday in this great session on marine ecosystems about the threat to tropical coral reefs, and in particular to Jamaican coral reefs, and yes, climate change is a real issue here. Um, the global bleaching events that we also talked about yesterday a little bit that have occurred 20, uh, 2015, 2016, for example, no, 2016, 2017, um, they are entirely linked to climate change. These events wouldn't have occurred without climate change. Uh, the changes we see in the ocean and the impacts on marine ecosystems are very severe and, uh, and, and coral reefs are in particular susceptible to both increased carbon uptake by the ocean, so ocean acidification, as well as heat marine heat waves. So we have learned about degree heating weeks, degree heating month, and, um, and coral bleaching, and this is what's happening. And um, if coral bleaching becomes too frequent, so occurs more than every five years, we, uh, we assume that there's little hope for tropical coral reefs to survive. And if you look at one and a half and two degrees, it means that already under 1.5 degrees, around 70% of all tropical coral reefs will be seriously degraded and experience uh, bleaching more of a frequency more than every five years. Whereas under two degrees, it will be basically all of them. Uh, so if there is a little window for these unique and precious systems to survive, then it is one and a half degrees. If we go above one and a half degrees, there's very little hope that uh, tropical coral reefs will remain. Uh, and this can happen in the very near future, so this is really a very strong impact. And similarly, um, the relevance of this providing ecosystem service to tourism, but also to fisheries, you all know much, much better than I do. And all these systems are, under, uh, are, uh, are at risk when these uh, coral reefs are, are, are disappearing. Um, so it's something we should take very, very seriously. Uh, we've done a big review on, on a, a range of other indicators, including ex increases in extreme precipitation and uh, risks for agriculture, where uh, a warming of one and a half degrees would not necessarily be of glo a global risk, but for tropical regions, you can already see detrimental impacts of, of warming there. I'm not going to go in, into great detail. I, I want to focus on, on, on something else there, because I want to move on to something that is uh, even, in a way, bigger than global mean temperature, and that's sea level rise. Um, sea level rise is just about to start. Uh, so our generation, our parents' generation, not so much yours, but uh, um, certainly the Europeans or Western, Western generation, will be remembered in human history as the generation that started sea level rise. Um, sea level rise will not stop over the centuries to come. And um, we can strongly influence how much we will get. And we can get multimeters of sea level rise. But as we remember generations 300 years ago that did or did not do something, uh, we will be remembered as the ones that caused the sea level rise and contributed very drastically to it. And I'll, I'll have some, some studies to show you that. Um, and it really means that in the very long run, we can get multimeter sea level rise. And it's obviously of great concern and of great importance to limit that. Um, so what we've done is really we have looked at sea level rise just under the constraints of the Paris Agreement. Um, so with scenarios that stay, you know, just go a little bit above one and a half degrees, but stay well below two and then go down again or something like that. So very ambitious scenarios. It doesn't mean that, uh, that there are not others out there. If you go on the current trajectory, uh, we can easily get uh, four or five meters of sea level rise over the coming centuries. Um, so we have focused on the very lower end and focused on so-called subtle differences uh, and investigated the imp importance of early action there, really. Uh, and what you see, so these are CO2 emissions up to 2050, and basically all these scenarios, as we've seen earlier, basically need to go to zero you know, uh, um, by the second half of the century. And then some of them go a bit below zero, and then we have slightly declining temperatures slowly over centuries to come. And now comes the sea level rise, and what you see here is basically it still goes up. Temperatures are long stable. Yeah? So since 2050, 250 years they are stable, and sea level rise still goes up. There's no sign even of a slowdown. Um, if temperatures decline, it's slowing down a little bit. So this is the framework we are working in there. It really means even though we, re we stabilize temperatures, sea levels will continue to rise and basically 
stabilizing them as soon as possible is quite relevant. And we've looked at these different characteristics. We just asked ourselves, what, when does global, do global emissions peak, and how does this affect future sea level? And um, here's the summary of this. So basically, it's really just curves that are very similar, but the delay in global, or the peak in global CO2 emissions is just pushed backwards from 2020, which is just around the corner, to 2035. In Earth history, that's, that's really nothing, right? Earth history wouldn't care about 15 years. This is sea level rise since the beginning of the pre-industrial area. So in here you see it slowly taking up, right? And we have around 20 centimeters by now. So what, what is the difference between these two scenarios? It's uh, half a meter in 2300. And they're completely the same after here, right? They just, there's 15 years difference in action, and then they're completely the same. So for centuries, we are, we are at the very same uh, emission level. We have, we have ceased emissions, but the difference in sea level is very, very profound. And for every five years we delay global peaking in CO2 emissions, we get on the midterm, we get uh, around 20 centimeters extra of sea level, which is as much as we have just seen since the beginning of pre-industrial times. So this is really, this comes from the slow response times of all these systems we look at. We look at glaciers and they are uh, reacting on timescales of, of decades, which is comparably fast, to the ocean, an ocean heat uptake and the speed of those processes, to the reaction timeframes of ice sheets like the Western Arctic ice sheet or Greenland, which really respond or have just started to respond to the warming and the big experiment we are doing with the globe. So yeah, there's really a very substantial difference there and that's really just renewing the call for stringent and urgent climate action. And this is what I want to talk uh, towards the end of my call, so I give us a bit of an idea of where we stand, where we have to go, and then hopefully uh, finish off of an, on a positive note, because I always feel that's a bit important. Um, so we have, we have seen that, right? So we know this curve, we know, okay, this is temperature, this is cumulative emissions, we probably want to do something about it. But um, now I want to explore a little bit this uncertainty. So we don't, you see that's actually quite substantial. I just plotted it here for two degrees, but basically the carbon budget, we don't exactly know how much CO2 we can emit to get a certain warming because there are lots of feedbacks in the Earth system related to water vapor, related to a lot of other things that we cannot constrain very well. But this means that when we normally talk now, when you read to in order to achieve one and a half, in order to achieve two degrees, it's always linked to probabilities. If, you, if what people call a two degree pathway, if you read that in international newspapers, it's a 66% two degree pathway. It's a 66% probability of achieving the goal. That's not particularly high, <laughs> right? If you talk, if we talk about a one and a half degree pathway, it has a 50% probability of achieving one and a half degrees in 2100, just toss off a coin. But the difference between the two is just 14%. So this is one and a half degree by 2100 here on the y axis, and this is uh, below two degrees over the full century on the x axis. And you'd see that going from 66% to 80%, that's just, you know, here's 50% here's probability there, and this is just 80%. So you go from here to there. Not much. It's just 14%. So even if we aim for one and a half degrees, we don't quite know if we get there, but we just increase the probability of getting to two. But if we just aim for the lower two degree pathway, we certainly not get to one and a half degrees, and we have a very substantial probability of not even getting to two. So this is quite important. It's not particularly... Um, or like not particularly optimistic, but it's important to know that these uncertainties are quite fundamental and we talk about stringent climate action and we always need to think about a precautionary principle as well because we cannot know on which end of this we will we'll eventually uh, be. Um, so what do we need to do? Uh, there's a carbon law, which is quite straightforward, that tells us what we need to do to achieve one and a half degrees. We need to halve global emissions every, every decade. So we need to peak in 2020, and we need to be to half by 2030, we need to be half by 2040, and we need to be zero around mid-century. Um, and this is, this is what is plotted here. That sounds very ambitious, and indeed it is. Um, but this is what is required. And as we know, if we don't cease emissions, temperatures will just continue to rise. Um, so where are we? So this is a one and a half degree pathway, a two degree pathway, and this is where the political commitments that are currently on the table will put us. So we are a very sizable amount, about 50% of present day emissions too high uh, for getting us to one and a half degree pathway. So yes, a lot needs to be done and a lot needs to be done very urgently as we've seen. And a lot of these things are out of the hands obviously of the Caribbean people who are at the forefront of climate change. So you really, 
the trust there has to be through political processes that I was uh, uh, showing in the first place or in, in the beginning of my talk that can un do make a difference because the moral integrity of this process is very important, fortunately, to many players in the world, not speaking of the current US president, but many others who value, at least to some extent, still multilateral agreements. So this is what countries are doing. There are some countries who actually do enough for one and a half degrees. Morocco and the Gambia, you would be surprised to not see any developed countries on this list. It's not so surprising because the per capita emissions are still very high. Yeah, and so in, in, in all the camp where you would see countries who actually have quite ambitious targets giving their population and giving their historical emissions, you'll find developing countries. Um, all the de major developed ones are basically leading us to a three or a four degree world. And currently where we're heading is between three and three and a half degrees from what's on the table. Um, so yes, a lot of them need to, be, need to uh, do better. A lot of them need to improve very considerably. Um, and I want to convince you, and ho hopefully uh, we will be able to convince them that this is also possible and feasible, because that's the good side to it. Um, there is a lot of change happening, and a lot of dynamics happening, and a lot of things that can be done, and that can even improve life on many different levels, and at the same time help us to get to one and a half degrees. And this is really an important message to link this to sustainable development and to link it to other goals that we may have. So this is 10 steps that we would need to do to get to 1.5. Obviously, renewable energy, no new coal power plants, we need to develop best practice in agriculture. That's something we probably want to do anyways, because it reduces soil erosion, it reduces uh, pollution of rivers and anything else. We really need to tackle, we need to get sustainable agriculture and climate smart agriculture uh, uh, done. We need to stop deforestation. Yes, we want to do that. Deforestation is, you know, we know very well that's nothing that we want to do, and we, for a variety of reasons we would like to tackle that. So this comes into play. This all needs to come together to do climate protection. I want to quickly talk about a main player that is important there, and then again you can link it to someone who digs coal uh, in your own head, but this is really coal is at the very heart of climate protection. If we don't manage to get out of coal, we cannot achieve a one and a half degree or any Paris Agreement goal. So this is the current coal capacity here in gray, and they'll just continue through their whole lifetime, basically, until they're, they're, they're done. And this is the planned capacity that comes on top of this. And this is what we can afford as emissions under the carbon budget we have for one and a half degrees. So all of this needs to go. So coal needs to be shut down. Coal needs to get out of the system, and there is no two ways about it. When coal stays in the system, we can forget the Paris Agreement. It's the very, very fundamental step that needs to be done. OK, that sounds, that sounds very ambitious, but actually it can be done. And one country that actually invented coal does it just now. UK has reduced their coal consumption by 85% in just five years, between 2012 and 2017. Just like this, they had the first coal-free day since 1882, last year. It can be done, it can be done quite rapidly. And they're coming, the renewables are coming in there, the carbon gas in there, so you know, it's, not, it's not all just you know, simple and, uh, and uh, carbon-free, but a lot of change is happening, a lot of change is possible. So calling for a coal phase-out is nothing you know, outlandish. It's really something that can be done. There's a coalition of countries uh, worldwide that aims for this as well. It's just important to understand that the very physics of the climate problem demand this, and there's no, you know, there needs to be a push, and there can't be a, uh, a debate. But it's good to have these examples that, that lead the way. And at the same time, and there's not more reasons to be optimistic, is renewable energy is becoming very, very, very cheap. And they're dropping in prices at an unprecedented rate. So they have dropped by more than 80% since 2000, between 2008 and 2015. And still, there, there are new surprises to be had by the technological development on that front. So what we compare here is for wind and solar, just the prices that IRENA, which is the world lobbying agency, if you want, for, or world agency for renewable energy, has estimated in 2016 for 2017. This is for offshore wind. This is for onshore wind. This is for PV. And this is for PV and storage. And these are the prices that we have seen. So within just one year, prices that have materialized on the ground are at times 50% lower than what the agency of the UN has guessed they would be. And in cases of uh, PV with storage, and you can think of Tesla here because they are driving force behind that, they ha it's 25% of the estimated price. That's, that's a completely different world. It's not that, that you need fossil fuels to develop. It's basically 
renewables in most countries in the world are now the cheapest source of energy. And it has happened in just a very, very short time. So there is really transformational change, and it is about taking advantage of the change, and it is about winning the future with technologies that are simply cheaper than other things and come with a lot of co-benefits when it comes to air pollution and whatever as well. And what this means really also for our projections, this is, um, and I'll, this is one of these models that underlie the IPCC assessments of where we need to go and how we can get there. They are uh, integrated models of energy and technology. And these are trajectories that they have studied uh, with this model in the AR4. So this is the IPCC range, and that's the deployment of global photovoltaics. It's the installed capacity in 2050 of solar. And this is the range that they had in 2014, given the, their uh, understanding of the technology and the learning rates of the technology at the time. This is the range that Greenpeace set in 2014, right? Probably the most optimistic one that you could possibly get. And this is what they get with the very same model setup, just an update five years later. They just updated the costs that we've seen because they were so unexpected to these models. And you see the deployment is two, three, four times higher than what they would have estimated. It's up to 50% in global primary energy in 2050 just by PV alone, not counting wind and not counting other sources of renewable energy. That's really a massive, massive change. And that's reason to be optimistic. And if it continues like it does, it just goes through the roof. There are reasons why this may not happen, but it, is, it tells us it tells us something about the speed of change once we reach there and once technology really takes over and matures. So it's really, it's, it is an uphill battle and probably now more than ever given the, the global political circumstances. But once you reach the peak of the mountain, you get the ball rolling and this, the thing starts moving by itself. And uh, we are close to this with renewable energy. We need to get there with uh, fossil fuel, uh, with, with electric cars, electric vehicles. We need to get there with uh, housing and other things really on our way to a carbon-free society. But if we get there, we can also get to one and a half degrees and then basically avoid the impacts that I've been showing you before. And with that, uh, I'll leave it uh, here. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl. We have 10 minutes for questioning right on time. Do we have? Any questions? Yeah, that's <laughs> sure, no problem. <laughs> okay, we can. Yeah. we can do yeah. that. <laughs> In one of your uh, later slides. I noticed that you did not include shipping, but there have been, or there has been, some commitments to reduce the emissions. How would that affect your calculations? It's, it's a good point and a very good observation, <laughs> and it probably should have included shipping. Um, it is, I'm not, don't, don't know me, it's about, Two, three percent of global emissions are aviation and shipping. I don't know if together or separately. So I, you know, I'm not. It's not exactly my, my area, so I don't have the, the number at the back of my hat. Um, but there has also been an, an IMO agreement now uh, on shipping and in order to reduce emissions there. Um, one of the key things is that, and also risks with shipping and aviation as well, is that both are not included under the Paris Agreement, so they run separately. And s certainly, we, we need to reduce emissions. They are not, let's say, the key things of global relevance. They are also they're not comparable with the electricity sector or the mobility sector or the housing sector in terms of, or industry in terms of the share of global emissions. But they're very pertinent and a permanent source of it. So yes, they need to be tackled. Um, but I also think they can be tackled, and there are there are you know a lot of experiments with alternative uh, um, fuel techniques in, in the shipping sector and so on. And this will also obviously come with a lot of uh, cool benefits when it comes to, you know, coastal pollution, air pollution, and so on. Um, so yeah, very, very good observation, and um, it needs to be part of the solution, that's for sure. Um, with the importance of the Paris Agreement, what, what would you say, or what are your comments on the potential impact of um, the new president? Well, he's not the new president, the 
Donald Trump and, and America, because obviously we see how much, how to the, the left side of that graph you showed America's not doing very well. So under a Trump administration, what's your projection for the future? Well, certainly not a very optimistic one. It's, it's mixed, though, because renewable energy is being built in Republican states, for example. The biggest wind energy deployment in the US is happening in Texas. Not because they're particularly keen on climate protection, but because it makes economically sense. And then there are a lot of actors within the US, uh, in particular the big and economic powerful states, like California, that have very stringent targets themselves. Um, and there is a lot of initiative from within the US to achieve the uh, originally target that the Obama administration has put in, despite the Trump government. Let's see how that, how that plays out. Uh, what is important, though, obviously, is that climate protection is, is multi, a multilateral thing, right? Greenhouse gases are well mixed. We need all to be, we need to be cooperative and we need to be working together. And the Trump administration on many, many levels, not just climate, is working hard to undermine international trust and multilateral cooperation. And this is a very serious threat. And, and this is also important, it, um, uh, it empowers a lot of other forces in different countries to slack behind, right? To not be ambitious, to not go forward, to have good arguments to speak to their governments not to do. So my home country of Germany, for example, is failing their climate protection plans right now. And uh, you can really see that climate is not very high on the political agenda anymore. And they also they get away with it because if anyone brings up climate, everyone else points to Trump and compared to Trump, they still look reasonable, right? So there's a lot, well, it's, it's, you know, that's a very low bar. But it's a big problem because this happens everywhere and basically it slows down much needed climate action. But on the bigger scheme of things, the very relevant decisions for our future are not being taken in the West anymore. They are being taken in, in particular in Asian countries and in, in just a few decades from now in Africa. The development trajectories that these countries do, each of Indonesia, Malaysia, Pakistan, Vietnam, Bangladesh, each of, each of these countries has the potential to push us above two degrees by themselves. It's like countries with 200, 300 million people. If they go on US trajectory of growth, that's it. And the decisions that are done there now, the decisions to go into coal or to not go into coal, the decisions to go uh, to, to uh, invest in renewables or not, that's what matters. Trump tries to revive coal in the US, but he has a, a hard time, right? Because it's simply not economically viable, and maybe he builds two new coal power plants. doesn't matter. In, in East Asia, there are like dozens of coal power plants probably opened every week. That's where, that's where the difference is, is to be made, and, and hopefully uh, these countries will still keep on uh, doing climate protection. But yes, certainly it has, it has become much more difficult, and it's not also for historical reasons and the trust in all of this, it is a very, very bad sign. And I think it's on many levels, it depends now what the Europeans are capable of doing. And um, yeah, I don't know how optimistic one should be at this point in time. But um, yeah, it's a difficult question. Carl, an excellent presentation. But when you were talking and you know, taking us through, all I could think was, what can each individual do to to make sure that something like this doesn't happen. And towards the end, you put up some solutions, which all seem to be at a, at a cost to an individual. Like, you know, if you go into renewables, I know in Germany, when you sell back to the grid, it's a much higher rate than you would do it elsewhere in the world. What message do you have for policymakers and, you know, putting subsidies on renewables, hybrid cars? Um, you know, what is the message that we all need to leave here with that we all can contribute or not, rather not contribute towards that 1.5 degrees or that 2 degrees? Um, well, I think it's a lot of, uh, it's, it's a lot of small things that you can do, but there are also obviously dig bigger things in showing how, to, how you value environmental uh, issues, you know, in, in, in political decisions and, and many other levels. Um, it's not so much, it's not the story of sacrificing anything. It's just the story of doing things differently and getting renewables for your house and the battery and you know, being in energy independent comes with a lot of other benefits, right? It's just a decision to be made uh, or not. It might be a bit more expensive in the first place, but maybe in the long run it pays off even. Uh, to decide 
you know, what other profiles in terms of consumption, looking at the CO2 footprints of things and just trying to adjust that, it really has, an, has an also a transformational element to it. So I'll tell you a little story about dietary change. It's probably not the most popular thing to talk about, but our diet, diets are a very substantial part of our individual uh, um, emissions because of the fodder that, that livestock needs, because of the methane emission in particular from cattle. It is, it is a very sizable share for Germany. It's about 20% of our per capita emissions is basically food consumption. And uh, obviously, if you would go for a less meat-heavy diet, it would has, have a great, a great impact. And I'm not saying anyone, you know, you, there's no moral obligation to do this. It's just basically you need to be aware of those things in order to make conscious decisions. That's, that's what's important. That's what it is about. And what happened in Germany, and what I found quite remarkable, is you never, you know, German, if you think of Germany in your head, you think of pork and sausages, right? And, um, but more and more people are actually turning to its a vegetarian and vegan lifestyle, as you probably also know from the US. And now some of the biggest sausage producers in Germany are starting to produce vegan products because they see people switching. They see a change in demand. They see people want to have different things. Uh, and therefore, they change their portfolio. And this is not, it's not a, uh, obviously, it's not changing the world per se, but it is a really, it is, it, is a, it is a network effect. It's a cumulative effect. Then more and more people see this, may also consume this. You know, it really changes, slowly but surely changes the landscape of consumption. And similar things are true for mobility. Similar things are true for housing and a lot of things. I think if you go through that list, you can easily, you know, come up with things yourself that in your daily life may make a difference. And if a lot of people do this jointly, then basically the sum is bigger than, uh, uh, is more than the, uh, than the parts. And, and you get, you know, you get visibility, you get businesses changing and everything. There are a lot of change agents in society and a lot of them are, are individual and you don't, relying on your individual action alone will not change anything. It needs to be, uh, it will change something, but not enough. It needs to be something that's visible or it will be visible in a group and it will trigger change by business. It will trigger change by government. It is a slow process, but there's a lot of potential in it. Nuclear energy. You haven't given much attention to that. If there were the political and restraints removed and the fear of adopting nuclear energy, what contribution do you think safe nuclear energy, as safe as coal might be, clean coal, could be in reducing the carbon emissions? Um, first, an answer to your second question, there is no such thing as clean coal. It doesn't exist. <laughs> uh, even if you would equip coal with uh, some tools for carbon capture and try to store it to CO2, still 20% of the emissions uh, will remain. So clean coal is, 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 is a myth. Um, on nuclear power, uh, there are a lot of these models who consider nuclear power. Um, so all these energy economic models. It just doesn't make much of a difference because it's economically not viable. Nuclear power is anyway is just economically viable because you don't, fa you don't price in uh, the disposal of nuclear waste. If you would never, no one would ever have built a nuclear power plant. And I can tell you from my home country of Germany that the prices uh, for finding this spot are outweighing any gain that we ever had from having nuclear energy in the first place. Uh, because you need, you know, basically you need to have safe, safe disposal spaces for millennia, right? If you just, just do, you know, the economics of this are just uh, ruling it out. But it's, this is not even priced in. It's just basically building nuclear power stations. And colleagues from the UK can tell us an interesting story what it means to build a power plant in the UK. It's just, they're just too expensive. They're just not competitive. Renewable energy is just cheaper. It goes much faster. It is, you know, planning and building a nuclear power plant. It's not, you know, China built some. There are some of the nuclear powers built some, and they can, you know, for the scale they have, it makes sense. But for large parts of the world, and economically by now, um, the costs that, that this entails uh, are not viable anymore compared to renewable energy sources. All right. uh, I have my questions are basic. Uh, I would like to know, I, well, I understand the biological system have a way of absorbing uh, carbon or carbon dioxide, and based on um, climate change uh, having an impact, the carbon dioxide having an impact on climate. Uh, I would like to know: 
Is it that the water bodies and other biological systems are saturated with carbon dioxide that they are not able to absorb further? Is that the reason why uh, there is continual increase in the carbon uh, dioxide? Um, the main reason is that we are emitting uh, carbon dioxide from fossil fuel sources. So any, any car that drives, any power plant, also any cement that's being done, they are emitting CO2. Uh, so that's anthropogenic sources of CO2. Every forest that burns down emits CO2. Um, so this is, uh, this is where it comes from. And yes, you're very right. A large part of this goes into uh, the ecosystems. And basically, if you look at the global CO2 concentrations, you can see the planet breathing. I can only recommend looking at, if you look at the CO2 record, you can see how the northern hemisphere greens and then loses its leaves again. because the turnover of carbon in the natural systems is much more than our emissions. It just basically is an equilibrium, and we push it out of equilibrium. Um, so from what we emit in terms of CO2, a good 20-something percent goes into our natural ecosystems, so terrestrial ecosystems. A good 20 percent goes into the oceans, and the rest stays in the atmosphere. Um, so yes, they play a, a pivotal role, but um, we are talking about the additional part it will not be absorbed uh, by ecosystems, but stays in the atmosphere and therefore is changing our planet. Okay. Thank you very much, Carl. Well, Roxanne is coming. Let us thank Carl for his um, presentation. Thank you. And before Roxanne gets here, we're going to invite you to a public forum where Carl is going to talk to us about communicating science, and he might even sing at 6 o'clock at the underground. <laughs> Madam Chair, good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, on behalf of the organizing committee and the faculty of science and technology, I wish to extend to you a warm thank you for sharing with us on 1.5, a global perspective. Thank you for showing us that a half degree does make a difference. And so with that, I just want to tell you thank you for sharing with the UWI community and invited guests today. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. So you will see in your program that we have um, a public forum at 6 o'clock at the Undercroft, and then at 7.30 we're going to have the alumni social, so we're inviting all alumni to come and join us. There will be refreshments, and we might have singing. So we'll take a 20-minute break, and we will be back here at 3.30. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We appreciate your continued support.